Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium. My name is Jonathan Holquist. I'm the manager of public programs. The mission of the Vancouver Aquarium is to conserve aquatic life. Uh, tonight's presentation, uh, Deep Sea Monsters, is a part of our Sea Monsters Reveal lecture series. Uh, the Sea Monsters Reveal uh, exhibit is here at the Vancouver Aquarium until September. You can come check it out and see what some of the creatures of the deep look like. Uh, tonight's talk uh, is about the deep sea creatures that we find off of the BC coast. And we've invited some special guests to be with us here tonight. Uh, Ocean Networks Canada is an organization, a uh, university base that's going out and actually studying in real time what's going on off the coast of British Columbia, Canada, and uh, collecting all kinds of oceanographic data. They have sensors like cameras and temperature uh, that they record all kinds of information and you can actually watch what's going on in the deep sea uh, through their sensors, which is really amazing. Uh, we have uh, uh, some young folks here tonight uh, that I wanted to mention because uh, I think the deep sea is something that uh, is of interest to many of us and starts at a very young age. Our youngest uh, member of the audience tonight is Brendan. He's five years old. And uh, one of his favorite deep sea creatures is the anglerfish. And um, he's come to hear our speaker tonight. And uh, um, you know, we hope that he will be inspired to switch his career from entomologist to oceanographer. Uh, so our speaker tonight is the chief scientist of Ocean Networks Canada. Uh, he is a professor of o uh, Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of Victoria. He has over 30 years of experience studying uh, in the ocean. He's explored most of the world's oceans. He said most, not all. So the only place he hasn't really done a lot of studying is the Indian Ocean but he's covered all the rest. So he's definitely an expert in my book. Uh, and he's focused a lot on marine microbes. And uh, recently my daughter, my six-year-old daughter was learning about germs at school and came home and said that germs are bad. And I was like, no, sweetheart, some germs are good. And uh, then I asked our expert tonight before our presentation and, and I, I just wanted to confirm, yes, there are some germs and microbes that are good for us. So just for the record, uh, in case you were wondering, uh, and he did his PhD uh, studying snail feces. So four years dedicated to following snails in petri dishes and looking at what's coming out the other end. All right, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Kim Juniper. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I won't go on anymore about the snail feces. That's, that's in my <laughs> distant past. Uh, I've since moved uh, deeper in the ocean. What I want to do this evening is to tell you something about monsters in the deep in, in the very loose and broad uh, sense of the term. Monsters in terms of living monsters, but then there are other monsters that are machines. If we, if we look at machines like this from, from the point of view of the organisms that live in the ocean, this is a monster that suddenly comes from, from above. So I, I'm going to use this in a very loose term, and, and we'll discover together both the, the organisms, strange organisms that live in, in the deep ocean, as well as some of the rather monstrous technology that we use to, to explore the deep sea. Why, why the deep sea? Well, in, in fact, if you look at this way we split the globe up here, sorry, wrong button. You can see that dry land occupies only 29% of the surface of our planet. Water that's uh, less than two kilometers deep, another 11%. 60% of the Earth is covered by more than two kilometers of water. So it is, in fact, the, the largest habitat on our planet and the one that we know the least about. We've, we've mapped the surface of the moon better than we have mapped the floor uh, of, the, of the deep ocean. During the first decade of, uh, of this century, uh, scientists from more than 80 nations globally got together in a huge international project called the Census of, of Marine Life. They spent 10 years collecting specimens, reviewing catalogs, going to all the oceans of the world, and they came up with this number, that there are 246,000 species of organisms living in the ocean. Before they started, the number was 250,000. But there was a lot of uh, species that were called several different names. So we, we did clean up the catalog quite a bit. And 
but really you've only really looked at 5% uh, of the deep ocean. So the, the estimates of what remains to be discovered in the deep sea uh, range from half a million to even up to 10 million species. But they're inaccessible, really difficult to get at. I, I didn't really uh, get this quote from Jules, Jules Verne, but if he were here today faced with a problem of trying to do an inventory of species in, in our ocean, I'm sure he would agree with this. He certainly uh, was big on technology. He really stimulated the imagination of, of the public by, with Captain Nemo in the Nautilus submarine going around the world, being attacked by strange uh, monsters in the, in the deep ocean. And while I haven't had access to, to the Nautilus, I spent the last 30 years of my career using this kind of technology to, to explore the deep sea. It's really the only way that we, we have been able to get there. But I, what I'll also be showing you tonight is, is now the deep sea is accessible to all through these cabled uh, observatory networks that we have under the ocean. For the past century, we've been exploring the deep sea using two, two basic approaches. We go to sea on research vessels, and we lower things over the side to, to collect samples, to, to collect data. You can see here we're bringing up a chunk of the, of the sea bottom mud in this big box coring device here. We bring that back onto the ship. We've got a quarter meter squared of the deep sea floor. Okay, you remember this thing is 60% of the surface of our planet. So we bring up a, a tiny little piece of this to the surface. We dig out the organisms that are in it, and then we make extrapolations about what the rest of the picture looks like. It's a, it's a good first step, but obviously we need to do a lot better than that. We can collect samples of water from the, from the very depths of the ocean by lowering devices over, like this over the side. We now have autonomous uh, vehicles that can make maps of the deep sea floor and then come back to the surface vessel at the end of the day. And we can also uh, tow things behind the ship to, to make maps of the sea floor and slowly build up information in, in the deep ocean. But that's not really been there just yet. So there are a couple different ways of actually being there, at least visually for scientists. The, the most common one um, these days is using remotely operated vehicles. These are submersibles that are essentially deployed over the side of the ship. They're connected to the research vessel by a cable that provides power and communication. And then the vessel, uh, the vehicle essentially goes around on the seafloor doing explorations, collecting specimens, deploying experiments. And the people in the control room on the ship you can see there are two rows here. The front row is occupied by the pilots who have total control of the vehicle. And then the scientists sit in behind uh, watching uh, the various uh, screens of, of imagery and, and data that are coming up from the vehicle. So this, it's a little bit like a, a space mission. We're all together in the control room with, uh, with, with lights out. And uh, fortunately, uh, at least there's, there's a, a cafeteria down the corridor so you can actually uh, go and get something to eat. Another way of doing this is even more up close and, and personal where we use what were called occupied submersibles. In the old days, we used to call these manned submersibles where uh, one or two scientists gets in a deep diving submersible and you can go to the seafloor for the day and do as we were doing with, with a remotely operated vehicle, drive around, collect samples, do a little bit of mapping, and then at the end of the day before it gets dark, you come back to, to the surface. This bubble-like sphere here, this is one of the Johnson Sea Link um, submersibles is operated by the Harbor Branch Foundation in, in Florida. So you can actually sit inside this sphere, sorry, and uh, it's quite an experience sitting inside this dome. But these domes uh, cannot take the pressure of the really deep sea, so they can only go to about 1,000 meters deep in this. If you want to go deeper, you've got to use something like the two Russian uh, Mir submersibles here that can go to over 6,000 meters in depth and even stay down for, for two days, although it's not really pleasant to spend two days in one of these things. It's a two meter diameter sphere with no bathroom. So, uh, but you get work done. It's, you, this is done in the name of science. But as I mentioned, this is not accessible to all. If, if the public wants to discover the deep sea, to learn more about the deep ocean, not everyone has the access to, to vehicles like this. And where you can, this is just kind of a reconstruction of a quick dive in, the, in one of these manned submersibles where you uh, sink down. It takes you about an hour and a half to get to the seafloor at, at 1,000 meters depth or even 2,000 meters depth. You sink very slowly in a controlled descent. You don't want to go too fast because you don't have any brakes to stop when you, uh, when you get to the bottom. And you see all sorts of interesting creatures like this, this worm swimming in the, in the water column here. This is a polychaete worm that normally lives on the bottom. 
but for part of their, their life cycle, uh, the males uh, grow wings and, and go in search of a, not quite wings, but they grow these extended uh, legs here, and they go swimming off in, in search of a mate. Ocean Networks Canada, the organization that I've been uh, working with uh, for, for a number of years now, has done something different. We brought the, the deep sea online um, to everyone, the entire global research community and any members of the public that are interested in, in learning more about the deep ocean. So you don't have to have access to one of these research vessels or one of these very expensive uh, submarines. And we've done this by um, deploying fiber optic cables uh, underneath the ocean and, and connecting this to, to instruments and, and sensors. There's a couple of networks here in the Strait of Georgia. Uh, a small one in San Inlet, and another where a cable comes out from near the uh, sewage treatment plant in Vancouver out into the, into the Strait of Georgia. And then our longest um, cable network um, leaves from Port Alberni. It's 840 kilometer loop here of cable and comes back into land. And you can see there are little points along here. And rather than having me uh, take you on, a, on an exploration um, trip here, I've, I brought along a helper this evening a deep sea skate who is going to sh show us what's going on with our technology from the point of view of an organism that's used to cruising um, the deep ocean. So this is a male. You can tell by these two claspers hanging out the back end. You find these at uh, up to 3,000 meters depth. Wing tip to wing tip, they can be up to two meters across here. So they're beautiful, huge, graceful creatures that are, that are predators in the deep ocean. They, they cruise along near, near the bottom. And, and looking for essentially something, something to eat. So what we're going to do here is have the skate take us on a little voyage in the deep sea as, as he would normally see the, the, the technology. Now he knows that uh, along the route of that cable there are these large yellow objects here which are called seafloor nodes. And what these things do are they connect the, the instrument platforms, these, the sensors that are on the seafloor, to the backbone cable, that's this big loop of cable here. So these, these red dots here uh, signify where we have these big nodes on the seafloor, which are, which are quite large. One of them would occupy about half of the, the front end of this room. They're really a, a big, a monstrous piece of, uh, of technology. And then if you follow the cable from the node, you end up see, uh, coming across instrument platforms like this. So rather than flinging our sensors all over the place. In, in many cases, we group them together on four-legged platforms like this that are about the size uh, of, a small, of a smart car, maybe a little bit longer. And the cable, we can then, we got all the sensors here, and they're in one place, they're measuring things together. But you can also notice that there are a bunch of cables hanging on the side of this thing in a so far neat and, and, and tidy way. That's because there are some sensors that they just don't work on a platform like this. They have to be uh, set off to the side uh, on their own. There are interferences between sensors. So things like this, this seismometer here that measures undersea earthquakes has to be put away from the vibrations and the electrical interference from the other instruments. This is a high temperature sensor here in a 350 degree black smoker vent that we'll be seeing in a, in a few minutes. Obviously, you're not going to put your instrument platform on top of that and expect to get it back the next day. This is a hydrophone assembly here where, again, you're listening to the ocean and you don't want to listen to the click and, and electrical noise from the other sensors on the platform. So we, we connect them by these little extension cables and, and, and put them a, a little further away. And then we also have all sorts of, of, of deep sea cameras. This is what really the biologists use to study the deep ocean. Most of the sensors that I've been showing you are OK for, for geologists and people who study geophysics, earthquakes, tsunamis, et cetera. But biologists are primarily limited to, to studying the deep sea organisms using cameras or cameras plus sensors that tell us something about what's going on um, chemically in the water. This particular camera system here it was built by Yves Air in France. Yves Air is, is a bit like uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. It's a French government organization that does um, deep sea research. And you can see this is the, the camera itself here looking down at this little uh, clump of, of worms, a couple of lights. And this camera fires up about every two hours for 15 minutes and essentially keeps track of what's going on in this general area. These, these blue hoses here are sensors that are measuring the, the chemical conditions in the, in the field of view of the camera. So when a worm, worm jumps, uh, we know why, or maybe we know why it's jumped. The temperature's gone up or oxygen's gone down, and we can interpret what they're doing based on, on what we know about the, the environment. We only turn these things on about every two hours for a few minutes because at these depths, light is a pollutant. 
Okay, there's no natural light in the, in the deep sea, so rather than affecting too much what you're trying to study with, with your study tools, we limit ourselves to a two hour per day uh, light budget that we can use in, in different ways. So now what our, our friendly skate is going to do is to, now that we've, we've outlined the basic technology, we're going to take a little tour and stop at some of the sites uh, along the, the Neptune cable route here. And we'll start with the one that's furthest offshore. This is the Endeavour Marine Protected Area. So this has uh, been set aside by Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, 12 years ago. There will soon be an exhibit here at the uh, Vancouver Aquarium um, showing um, this, this, this very habitat. So this is an area where there are hydrothermal vents. These are deep sea hot springs where we have hot water coming out of the seafloor because we're essentially sitting on the top of a, of a submarine volcano and seawater percolates down through the Earth's crust and then comes out. This is a video that this laptop doesn't like, but essentially we've got black smoker fluids here coming out of the, uh, the seafloor. Come on, laptop, keep going, keep going. I know you can do it. Okay, so this black smoke you see coming out here. This is high temperature fluid that's about 350 degrees um, Celsius. It's black because it has a lot of dissolved iron in it because it's been dissolving the rock beneath the seafloor. And as soon as it hits the, the cold two degree um, seawater, it immediately precipitates this, this black iron um, soot. And you can see that these big structures here are all covered by uh, tubes, okay? These are essentially some of the uh, hot vent worms that live only in this environment where we have hot springs on the seafloor. Hydrogen sulfide coming out in these fluids is essentially the energy source for the organisms that are, that are living in this environment. They're really tough. They, they're, there's not much biodiversity here, but any creatures that can, can survive in this environment, they do really well. Now let's move along a little bit to a site in the, at the deepest point in the Neptune network. We're at 2,700 meters depth, right in the middle of the, the flat area of the ocean that's known as the, the abyssal plain. And our, our friendly skate has a buddy that he, he stops in and, and sees here once in a while by the name of Corky. Now, Corky is an octopus that likes to hang out on corks. Not the type of corks that we put in, in wine bottles, but these are deep sea corks that are in fact, they mark the top end of a borehole. So this is the, the ocean bottom here. And uh, about 10 years ago, we came out here with a scientific drilling ship and we drilled a hole in the ocean floor down to about 500 meters below the ocean floor, cased the size of the hole, and then put a big string of sensors down this hole here. So we could, because the, the, beneath the seafloor here, it's just like an underground water reservoir, okay? So there's, there's water here, there are pressure changes. So we can measure the temperature and the pressure below the seafloor through this string of sensors here that are connected to what we call the cork at the top. So one of these corks is actually plugged into the ne Neptune uh, cable network. And as soon as we got this thing all set up, we came back the next day and there's this octopus hanging out on the cork. And they just, they like to snuggle up to things. And, and in the big flat abyssal plane that, that's around, there just really aren't many objects that you can kind of rub up against. So it's adopted this, this cork as a, as a home. Sometimes you see it sitting like this. Or another time, he, he starts to be a bit of an acrobat and he's hanging upside down here. This is the connector that, that links the, the cork and the sensors below the seafloor through this cable um, back to, back to our, one of our instrument platforms and then, then the network and, and, and the internet. Okay, so let's leave Corky behind here and we're gonna move a little bit uh, closer to shore to uh, an area called Barclay Canyon. So we're out here, I'll just show you on the uh, on the map, so this is the edge of the continental shelf. This is the southern Vancouver Island here. So this is where the continental shelf, which is about 200 meters deep, um, suddenly drops down into the depths of, of the abyss. So it drops down to 2,000, even 3,000 meters depth. So we're right on the, on the slope of the edge of the continental shelf here. And at the edge of the shelf, it's not just a flat, uniform slope, but in fact, there are quite deep and steep um, submarine canyons that have been carved into the edge of the continental shelf by uh, underwater uh, erosion processes. So this is where we have our most complex um, suite of instruments from, from the Neptune network. Our node module is sitting out here at this, this, this axis that you can see. And then from there, we've got all sorts of cables running all over the place, including one that comes down onto this little shelf here deep into the canyon. The, the floor of the canyon here where this last um, instrument platform is, is 1,000 meters deep. 
Whereas up here on top, uh, a few tens of kilometers away, we're at about uh, 300, 400 meters depth. So it is, it is quite a canyon and there's quite a slope here. As, as you come up and down here with the remotely operated submersible, you know you're climbing a slope. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a gradual climb. So down here, um, we've got another friend of our, of our skates. He has a friend called Wally. Now Wally is a, a different kind of sea monster. Wally is a tracked vehicle that lives permanently on the seafloor. He's connected by this cable to, to the network. And he's operated by uh, a scientist in Germany 8,000 kilometers away over the internet. And Wally needed a car wash. So we went down with the ROV, got this nice toilet brush here from uh, the dollar store, and we essentially gave Wally a nice clean. So this is this camera dome here and some of the other sensors. And we spent about an hour and a half uh, cleaning Wally so he could spend another year on the sea floor. Normally there are two Wallys. And every year we go out and swap and put the clean fresh one down and bring the old dirty one back up. But that year uh, Wally 2 got hung up in customs. So the solution was the, the toilet brush. And that, got us, that bought us another year, and we were able to uh, keep this little monster um, on the seafloor for, for another year. We'll be picking him up in late August this year. And finally, and, and, and after two years of, of loyal service on the deep sea, it's good German technology. It never breaks. We were actually deploying Wally uh, uh, the first time, carefully lowering him over the side of the ship, and the hook that was holding him uh, suddenly broke when a swell came and he fell not a thousand meters to the seafloor, landed on his feet, plugged him in and he worked right away. So he's very reliable. This is one of Wally's friends. That's a, this is related to the king crab. It's a slightly smaller. You wouldn't want to eat one of these, but they're pretty. And you can see, again, uh, like many of the deep sea creatures, the minute you put a man-made object on the seafloor, they like to, they're curious. They like to snuggle up, snuggle up against it. Uh, bearing in mind, of course, that it's totally dark down there and they can't see it. So they discover this uh, in the dark and eventually just, just start hanging out by it. Now I'm going to take you on a little different voyage. We're going to leave our friend the, the skate behind here. And we've been talking about organisms in the deep sea, diversity, monitoring the deep ocean, and, and thinking of the deep ocean like something like a park that some people can visit. The lucky scientists that get to go down to submarines or out on research vessels, and it's, it's kind of out there and it's, it's doing fine, and we don't really worry about it too much. But in fact, as we, as our society has more and more demands for metals, uh, rare earth elements to make laser pointers, cell phones, laptop computers, projectors that are going on these screens. We're running out of these metals and, and rare earth elements in mines on land where we're taking them from for, for now. And we're slowly discovering in the deep sea that there are a lot of these metals that are available uh, if we have the technology again to be able to collect them. So this is one example here. This is a large uh, polymetallic chimney that's about 15 meters high at the Endeavour hydrothermal vent site. And it's essentially very rich in, in copper and zinc and a lot of metals. This is essentially the precipitates from those hot fluids. You can see that it's also animal habitat. It's covered by organisms. So if we want to mine these, obviously we're going to be mining animal habitat. It's not just an inert um, chunk of metal sitting on the seafloor to, to be taken. So this is happening. Okay, uh, we are now building machines like this. This is a real photograph taken um, about six months ago in a place in England where they're building the first of these deep sea mining machines. You can see the scale of the thing. There's a, there's a man standing here. And again, these will not have people in them going down to the sea floor. They will be operated like this from, from surface vessels. And these big teeth on the front here will essentially uh, work their way through these underwater mineral deposits that are, that are sitting there on the sea floor. And it will be operated like we do the scientific um, Submersibles, there'll be a guy sitting in a, in a chair here with a couple of joysticks um, driving this big machine along the seafloor all day long, chewing his way through uh, one, of the, one of these mineral posits. So this, this is coming. And in, in many ways, it's, you know, if we have to have these metals, it's, it's preferable to mining on land because there's certainly a lot less disturbance of habitat by going down and collecting this from the ocean. But this is the first time that we've really done this kind of exploitation of the ocean. So people are nervous about it. And, but at the same time, there's an opportunity here to maybe do it right this time. 
So the first mine that will be uh, exploited in the deep ocean is here uh, north of, of Papua New Guinea. This is Papua New Guinea. Australia is down here, for those who don't know where PNG is. And this is a site here in the Bismarck Sea called the Salwara One um, deposit, where there is a, about a tenth of a square kilometer mound of polymetallic sulfides, these minerals that were formed by these deep sea hot springs, that is very rich in copper and very rich in gold. And this company called Nautilus Minerals, was for, it's a Canadian company, based in, has their head office in Vancouver, and their operations are based in Brisbane, Australia. So these guys are pioneers in this. And they're, they also, they're very green. They, they realize that the you know, entire future of the mining industry is dependent on the, the first steps here being, being the right ones. So they've consulted with researchers globally, and they've come up with what, what one would think would be the, probably the best possible uh, damage mitigation plan in terms of uh, you know, being able to do this in a, I won't call it sustainable way, because obviously uh, when you rip something up from the seafloor, there's none left but in an environmentally responsible way um, so that uh, the area can be recolonized um, once the, the mine is finished. Now, they did have, have some rather crazy initial ideas like uh, transplanting snails with an ROV, but I think they've given that one up because it's uh, probably not worth the, the effort. So this is how their operation uh, would work. Okay, so they're gonna be essentially parked over this, this mineral deposit for about two or three years until they've excavated the entire thing. So they've built all three mining machines. There'll be three of them working at once. You can see the scale of these monsters. And they're in the process of finalizing the construction of what will be the research vessel, or the research vessel, I, it's force of habit, the mining ship that will be parked over top of this thing. So this ship will have huge power generating equipment on board and it will be providing power through these cables to these various mining machines that are down on the seafloor uh, excavating uh, the, the mineral deposit. And then there's a uh, what's called a subsea slurry lift pump. Essentially means we crush the minerals and then pump them back up to the ship and they go through a, a screen on the ship. The lumpy bits stay on the ship and then the, the wastewater essentially is going to be pumped back down to release the depth here rather than being released into the, into the surface ocean where there's uh, very pristine, clear water and, and a tuna fishery. So Nautilus is planning to start production in about the middle of 2017. So as I mentioned, in, in the, they are just finalizing the build of the ship. And then from there, they will go on to obviously doing some testing before they uh, actually start mining. This is, as I mentioned earlier, a very small scale operation, about a tenth of a square kilometer uh, it, for this deposit. And the other hydrothermal deposits are about the, sim the same size. Where the scale becomes different is with the mining of manganese nodules. There are huge areas in the deep uh, abyssal Pacific, at Southern Atlantic and Indian Oceans where the seafloor is covered by these little balls of manganese that are sort of fist size. They're, they're, they actually form on the ocean floor over millions of years by essentially precipitation of metals from, from ocean water. And they're very rich in manganese, cobalt, iron, copper, and just uh, a metallurgist dream. And they're all sitting on the seafloor waiting to be scooped up, end quotes. But in order for this type of operation to, and you also notice the depth here, we're somewhere between four and 6,000 meters. So these are really deep. In order for this type of operation to be economically viable, it's been estimated that these mine sites will have to be somewhere between 10 and 100,000 square kilometers in, in area. So that's the scale of environmental perturbation that we haven't even done on land with you know, clear cutting uh, forests and burning uh, Amazonia. This is, this is a really different scale. Obviously, it's uh, far into the future so far, but we've been, we now have a number of license areas where uh, various corporate and national interests have uh, essentially staked out areas in the, in the Pacific where they, they are doing inventories of the, of the density and the quality of these manganese nodules with an eventual plan to actually um, start mining when, it, when the market's right and when the technology becomes uh, 
reasonably uh, priced. So this is a scale of, that we, as I said, environmental perturbation that we've never really encountered on, on Earth before, and no one's really going to see it because it's way out there and way down there, and you know, it's a little bit like leaving a strip along the side of the road when you're clear cutting a forest. The tourists will just drive through and think, isn't this nice? Um, but uh, so there is, but at the same time, this is, you know, this is an opportunity to, to maybe do it right this time because uh, the, the world will be watching, and uh, this is going to be regulated by the International Seabed Authority, which is a, a UN organization. So sometime in the, in this not too far distant future, certainly beyond uh, the two year window we have for Nautilus exploiting those sulfides, we will be mining uh, manganese nodules. And when we do so, we're not just picking up a bunch of inert cannonballs on, on, on the seafloor. As you can see from these photos, that these manganese nodules are colonized by a number of different organisms. These are the, some of the prettier, larger mobile species that, that cruise around in the, in the abyss, scooping up little bits of food that you, that you find uh, on the seafloor. But even, even right on the nodules themselves, this is a hydroid. You can see the scale here, someone's fingertip. You have this kind of squishy, slimy thing sticking on the side of a, of a manganese nodule, and you think, okay, well, you know, who cares about this squishy, slimy thing on the side of a manganese nodule? Why should I worry about this? You know, if they're going to crush five billion of these squishy, slimy things, it's like, okay, it's like another dead mosquito, as far as, you know, one might be concerned. But, in fact, Here's an example of why we should be thinking about squishy, slimy things in the bottom of the ocean. Here's one here, this amorphous, squishy, slimy thing that, that essentially grows on, on pillars of wharves in, in the Atlantic Ocean, um, is now being marketed in 57 different countries as, as a treatment for ovarian cancer. Now, we, we're not harvesting these things. We essentially collected a few discovered that there's a, an anti-tumor molecule that's produced by this organism that we can now synthesize in the laboratory. So nature here served as, as an inspiration to, to identify molecules we'd never even thought of. And then rather than going out and, and, and harvesting tons and tons of these things, um, we can now synthesize them in the laboratory. There are not many examples yet of these drugs from the sea. In fact, uh, at last count, there were seven or eight uh, drugs approved by the U.S. Um, um, Food and Drug Administration that come from marine organisms. So we're, we're just starting to, to scrape the surface of it yet, uh, right now, but um, that does give you, uh, I think it's a really good example of why we should be worried about uh, uh, slimy things because they may eventually be, uh, may eventually be very uh, valuable to us. And to continue on the, on the uh, looking ahead uh, tomorrow and just uh, addressing particularly our five-year-old, soon-to-be oceanographer. When you make the, the deep sea available online to, to the global public, funny things happen. You can plan your public relations campaigns, you can plan your school programs, presentations in places like the aquarium, and, you get, and then a surprise comes out of the blue that really shows you the, the power of the internet and the ingenuity of, of, of people all over the world. I came into work one morning uh, in January 2013, and we had an email from this kid, Kirill Dutko, in, in Donetsk in, the, in Ukraine. He was 14 years old. And he discovered our underwater cameras, and he didn't realize that we were archiving all of our video. But he had memorized this, the on-off schedule for all of our cameras. And on the weekends, he would wake up just before one of our cameras would come on, and he would record on his laptop computer the five-minute glimpse of the deep sea that was coming from our cameras. He was really keen. You know, he probably should have been doing his homework at the time, but he, he was definitely um, on his way to, to becoming a scientist. And he set up his own YouTube channel called World of Ocean, and he would put these little clips on and write down what he knew about them. And up to that point, prior to January 13, He'd had 35 or 40 views on his, on his YouTube channel. So now that's a good start, uh, but it's, it's not, quite, not quite viral. So he sent us this email saying he saw a monster eating a hagfish. I'm not sure if any of you know what a hagfish is, but it's one of the most unpleasant creatures um, in the deep ocean. It looks like this. 
So this is looking from one of our underwater cameras when it comes on. And you watch, keep your eye up here. You're going to see something coming in from the top and scoop up this ugly hagfish and get it out of the, out of the way. Here we go. Boop. OK. Does anyone know what that was? A seal. OK, remember, we're at 1,000 meters depth here. OK, that's a kilometer down. It's pitch dark. I just got this on a loop until we're, until we're done with it here. So, OK, it's, it looks like a seal, right? It's not a whale. No. Here we go. Yep. So what that is, it's a female northern elephant seal. Now, prior to this kid seeing this thing online, because we were just feeding the video into our archive, and we just, you know, it was one too many things to look at. We knew that these seals dived to these depths because we, you know, glued sensor packs onto their backs and, and left them, you know, recovered them several days later, and they have been recording. And we knew that they ate hagfish because we would find dead seals on the beach, dead elephant seals on the beach, and we'd you know, cut them open and, and look in their guts and say, okay, they must eat hagfish because there's a couple of pieces of hagfish here. Um, but, uh, and so, and we also, knew, so they fish really deep in total darkness, and they, they cruise along the seafloor. They can spend up to an hour and a half at 1,000 meters depth just kind of cruising along the seafloor, and they sense something with their, the, you saw the big whiskers? Where are we going to? This finally stopped. All right, there we go again. Now, you notice the first thing that comes into view here are the big whiskers on, on, on the snout of the, of the elephant seal. And as soon as they sense something with, with their whiskers, they don't use their teeth to reach out and seize their food because that's, that's too slow. You're going to lose it in the dark. So what they do is they use their tongue as a piston and they push it back in their mouth and they create a, create a vacuum in front of their mouth that essentially sucks their prey right into their mouth to the point where walruses also do this. Uh, can I tell you kind of a gruesome story? Well, we, we know the walruses also do this um, to fur seals. And what they'll do is they come up to the fur seals and they'll wrap their, their flippers around them. The fur seals have a very flexible skull because they die. Okay? So they'll wrap their, their flippers around the fur seal and they'll put their mouth right on, their, on the head and they'll create this vacuum and they suck the brains right out of their cranium because that's the tastiest part of fur seal. So that's the kind of section force that these things can create with, with their tongues. So I, Carol Lutko was the first person to actually observe this act of predation in the wild. These, this gruesome story of the walrus was actually observed in, in an aquarium. I, I, unfortunately, um, as you know, what's been happening in Donetsk since uh, 2013, his family are now refugees um, living with some uncle in Crimea, and I'm not even sure he's still going to school. Okay, I'm just going to wind up here by uh, reminding us that we also have an installation in the Strait of Georgia, not just the Strait of Georgia tank, but those two, the Venus network in the Strait of Georgia. And we have a one-third scale uh, model of our, one of our OceanWorks nodes um, in, in the Strait of Georgia in this tank, and we will also be displaying live data from, from the depths of, of our sensors in, in the Strait of Georgia, where we can look at things like oxygen, um, pressure, velocity, temperature, et cetera. So why would, why would pressure change if you're just sitting on the seafloor? Maybe a five-year-old, that's a bit, of a, a bit of a challenging question, but could anyone help me? Why would you bother measuring pressure if you put something on the seafloor and it's going to stay there where you think, okay, we're at this depth? Waves. Sorry? Waves. Waves will definitely affect pressure. So, and uh, other things where you see the tides coming and going with your pressure sensors. And it's sensitive, you can actually see low pressure storm systems coming over because the weight of the atmosphere on the ocean changes. So we can actually sense them uh, on, on the seafloor. Okay, I, I'm going to stop here now and uh, show you some lovely tube worms from the Never Hydrothermal Vents and we've got time then to, to take questions. Thank you very much for listening. So does anyone have any questions? Could you go ahead and raise your hand? We'll come up with a mic. Are there any savvy scientists that have already said they would like to do the monitoring for the manganese nodule mining and the uh, other mining so we can do some before and after uh, 
There have certainly been lots of before studies uh, that have been done. We've surveyed, we know what organisms are living there. The, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, it takes those nodules millions of years to form, so the ecosystem recovery will probably be on that kind of time scale, which if you look at the history of life on Earth, is probably not very much, but in terms of our society, so yeah, it'll grow back. You know, it'll take 100,000, 200,000 years, but uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's relative. So somewhere on the scale or the order of fossil fuels, they're not necessarily sustainable uh, resource, but they will eventually come back. It just depends out. on how badly we want them and how much effort we're willing to put into doing this in a, in a controlled way. Okay, very good. Yeah, Kim, from one of the uh, nod modules that are there, how do you uh, get the the instruments spread out a lot in the array. So yes, we use these, those remotely operated um, submersibles that, that essentially are the workhorse of the maintenance of our, and the installation of the observatory. So that scene I showed you with the people sitting in the control room and the guy on the joystick, that's, we spend a month and a half, a, a year at sea doing that kind of work. We go out with a ship fully loaded with new parts, new, new uh, sensors. The ROV takes them down to the seafloor, unplugs this, plugs in the fresh one, pulls out the toilet brush if necessary, and essentially does, the maintenance is done remotely um, from, from, uh, from the vessel. Hi, so can you uh, synthesize manganese, uh, just like you had discovered you could produce a mole the molecule, underwater molecule that was then used in an ovarian cancer treatment? Unfortunately, we cannot. Manganese is an element, so there's nothing more, uh, you know, until we get into the Star Trek era where we can just take uh, protons and neutrons and electrons and, and, and synthesize anything, we're, we're not really able to do that. We still have to, we need these basic elements, uh, we have to find them in the, in the natural world. Yeah, I'm just curious. I've noticed a few articles uh, on, on the internet and in various uh, magazines over the last few months showing discoveries of new species. And I'm wondering, would there be a correlation between um, the discoveries of these species and the changes in acidity level in the ocean or, or global warming? What do you think? There is, but it's a perverse sort of correlation in that because we're worried about the ocean, we're spending more time looking at it, and as, as a result, we're discovering more species. Uh, we're not really at the point where ocean acidification is causing new species to, to appear and, and to evolve. That, that will eventually come. What it generally does is just eliminates some, and the tougher ones can, can stay. Hi, I'm wondering with uh, the camera setups on your various nodes, have you seen any unusual monsters other than the northern elephant seal that have been quite interesting and maybe a little bit unusual? We've seen some unusual phenomena with known species. I, I, one thing I was, was going to show you is about a month ago, we witnessed a massive migration of crabs right up the middle of Barclay Canyon. Uh, for a day and a half, it was sort of reminded me of the old descriptions of the, the buffalo herds on, on the plains where it would take a day and a half for the herd to go by. We saw this happening with, with this herd of, of uh, large crabs in the canyon. They were all moving up the canyon to, to shallower water for the mating season. And then they go back down to, to depth to, to release their, the, their eggs. So that, that we knew that, but the data that we had to do that essentially involves putting traps at different depths at different times of the year and, and seeing what you get. So now to be able to actually know the very day when this happens and to, to come up with some quantitative numbers is, is a lot of fun. And one thing we've also uh, noticed, particularly in the Barclay Canyon node, is uh, interesting connections between what's going on in the atmosphere and what happens on the seafloor. In the wintertime when you get big storms going by uh, on the, in the Pacific, it creates turbulence in the, in the water almost down to the 1,000 meter bottom of, of the canyon. And what that does is that the, the shrimp that are swimming at five, 600 meters depth, they don't like to be in turbid water. It's a bit, you know, when you're on an aircraft and you go through turbulence, it's not really pleasant. 
And for the shrimp, it's the same thing. So the shrimp are kind of driven down to the bottom to get away from, from the turbulence that's caused by the storm. And they get eaten by the creatures on the bottom. We're just sitting there pulling the shrimp out of the water. And we, we actually filmed that with, with one of our cameras. So you wouldn't think that there's that kind of teleconnection between an event on the atmosphere and uh, the arrival of food on the seafloor, but that actually happens. Uh, so how do, uh, how do we get a job uh, driving a submersible or working one of those uh, research vessels that goes down and, and looks for new things on the seafloor? Or you could do like our friend in the Ukraine does, where you simply uh, look at the data. Um, but to people, people who are interested in the career in, in marine biology, you usually go the, the university route, um, usually end up doing at least a bachelor's or a master's degree in, in biology or other branches of marine science. I'm, I'm a biologist, but you know, there are people interested in earthquakes under the ocean. So they're studying physics. So you, if you're good at math and physics and you like the ocean, then maybe that's a, that's a good connection. Or chemists are very interested in the, the quality of, the, of water quality in the ocean, dissolved oxygen, um, more things that we're concerned about these days, uh, metals and plastics in the ocean. So you know, there's, there's a way of, of becoming an ocean researcher. If you want to work on a research vessel, uh, in Canada, most of the research vessels are operated by the Coast Guard. So uh, there's, there's uh, the career path for you there to get a job with the Canadian Coast Guard and get some, some training in, uh, in seamanship or go to some place like BCIT where they offer uh, training for ship's officers and, and engineers. And could you, um, could you tell us how, how, many, how many folks uh, do you know are watching the, uh, the streams uh, that you're broadcasting on the web? We have, it's, it, that's a difficult statistics to, to calculate, but we have something on the order of, on an annual basis, seven or 8,000 visits to our, to our website at any one time. And it's, it's, it, it's up and down. When, when there's an event, something happens, you know, like anything on the internet, everyone rushes off to see the, the latest, newest thing. And for example, there was a Discovery Channel uh, program on sharks about a year ago, and the next day we had our biggest peak in, in viewership uh, that we'd had in years because they mentioned us once. And then it was gone two days later, and we were back to you know, basically, I think there's a question up front here. Okay, I think we have a couple more questions, and then uh, what I'll do is uh, ask folks to ask their other questions when we do our reception. Sure. I, I was wondering if there was any evidence for any bacteria or other types of organisms might be using more of the metals more than normal, if there's any sampling that you could say maybe more iron or manganese present in bacteria in the water samples around the nodules and other things. Certainly the, the nodules and the, the metals that I was showing you at the deep sea hot springs are areas that, that attract uh, completely different groups of bacteria that are specialists in, in the chemistry of metals. So they can use metals as an energy source or they can use metals to, to help them decompose things. And we find them, uh, the, even though there aren't very many, this is a photo of a, one, of the, one of the most common animals here at deep sea hydrothermal vents. There are only about 500 known species worldwide that leave, live at these deep sea hot springs. So that's not a lot of biodiversity. You can get that in one scoop of mud for that box score that I was showing you. Because it's a really tough environment, it's, it's hot, uh, the water is very acidic, there are metals in the, in the fluids, and it's, it's unstable. It can be here today and then, whoops, it's over here tomorrow. So there are only a few species that can put up with it, but there are probably thousands and thousands of species of bacteria. We're just starting to touch the, uh, the tip of the iceberg of understanding the microbes that live in this environment and, and perhaps looking at them to uh, to exploit them for, for biotechnologies. One of them is actually being exploited right now. And when you do DNA fingerprinting, or when you go to the hospital and you have a DNA test for, for tumors or for hereditary diseases, uh, they go into the lab and they use a special high temperature enzyme to make multiple copies of your, of your DNA. And that enzyme comes from uh, hot spring bacteria because it's specially adapted to working very efficiently at, at high temperatures. So that is you know, one real prime example of how 
microbes from an exotic world like this that we didn't think would be a, a particularly interesting I have real applications. It's a $500 million a year a global market for this enzyme and that keeps growing as everyone is, is able to do uh, DNA fingerprinting. All right, we'll do one final question here. Hi, I was wondering if you've considered or if you do use, you're using citizen science to help with your research? Yes, I think you know, we're just learning how to do this. Um, we've, uh, some, we've got an online game called uh, Digital Fishers where we have uh, researchers that identify sets of video that they would like help sorting through to find out um, the good bits and, and, and that they can look into further. So it's set up as kind of an online gaming environment where you can look at, you know, when you've got a bit of time, you look at a one minute click, clip and at the end, uh, you, there's a drop down menu, you can say, I saw seven uh, sable fish. And we're building up databases like that. And right now we're in the middle of doing uh, a test where we're doing a human versus computer uh, experiment where we had a graduate student in computing science at UVic develop a, a machine vision algorithm that actually counts sablefish. I'm not sure if you've seen sablefish or black cod, but if you ever go to a restaurant, they're probably the most expensive item on, on, on the menu. We have a lot of them at our Bar Barclay Canyon node. So they, they've trained the computer to be able to identify these sablefish and count them. And so we've got counts over a month of, of sablefish, and then we had our citizen scientists count the same video clips and count them. Then we had a, an expert PhD student do the same counting. And then finally, we had an undergraduate class in, in fisheries at the university do the same counts. And we're, we pulled all the data together. And it turns out the citizen scientists are just as accurate as the experts and, and the biology students at UVic. And the computer algorithm is about 85 80% accurate. So it, it tends to overcount things. And that, that kind of example shows you, OK, so we can use the computer to sort things, and we can get the citizen scientists more excited. And so we're, we're just learning how to do this now. And uh, I think it's more interesting for a citizen scientist, instead of just doing the dull spade work of you know, flipping through videos and counting fish, to know that you're, you're part of a project and a program and, and even competing against a, a computer algorithm. All right, well, great. Thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Kim Juniper for coming uh, to the Vancouver Aquarium tonight and talking to us about the deep sea monsters um, that live there and are also moving in. And also moving in, yes, um, the metal and those, monsters. And the metal ones Heavy and metal uh, monsters. biological ones as well. Uh, so uh, briefly, uh, we have some upcoming uh, public events here at the Vancouver Aquarium uh, for the evening. So we have on May 6th, we have an event called Monster Data well, we're going to be looking at how scientists take in all the video data uh, that's captured from tagging devices that uh, you mentioned earlier, actually, that we attach to marine mammals. And we can actually create video um, uh, productions of what's actually happening underwater. We're going to be looking at uh, a symposium of scientists that are looking at those data and trying to figure out how to work with statisticians to kind of crunch it all and make sense of it. And then on May 13th, we're having uh, our, our very own Dr. Jeff Marley have come back and talk about uh, an alternative to climate change as an explanation for some things that we're seeing here in the House Sound area and looking at regime shifts that are actually changing what some of the, what's happening with some of our ecosystems. So some really interesting lectures coming up as part of the Sea Monsters Revealed uh, lecture series. And if you want, you can also come to the aquarium during the day and check out the Sea Monsters Revealed exhibit. Uh, before we go, I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming out, uh, uh, and thank you to Ocean Networks Canada for being here tonight, and, and for Kim for coming out, uh, and for all of you, and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much, and good night. <laughs>